Okay, so, even if you know nothing about the Oscars, you've probably heard of this. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. They said La La Land won Best Picture, everyone goes on stage, and then a few minutes later they were like, whoops, actually, Moonlight won, and everyone went, wait, what? What you might not know about is the months and months of campaigning it took for Hollywood juggernaut La La Land to get taken down by tiny indie drama Moonlight at the biggest night in Hollywood. First, we gotta talk about this guy. This is Damien Chazelle, and he's at Harvard, and he's like, I've got an idea. What if we took old-timey singing in the rain type musicals, but we made them, like, modern? It's got dancing and jazz, but it's gritty. So he takes his first hack at this, and it's called Guy and Madeline on a Park Bench, and he even drops out of Harvard for a bit to finish it up. It jumps around the festival circuit and gets good reviews, but, like, it's a $60,000 black and white student film. It's, it's not gonna break the box office but it does get him a meeting with a studio. And Damien Chazelle's like, I wanna make this, but bigger and better. It's called La La Land, and it's like, you, you're, you're gonna love it. And the studio guy, he takes a puff of his cigar and he's like, all right, kid, we'll make your movie. We'll give it a million dollar budget, but uh, you gotta change the musical numbers, the jazz man, and uh, the ending, capiche? And Damien says, Chazelle, no, I'm gonna make a different movie instead. Then, when I've got clout, I'm gonna make La La Land the way I wanna make it. So he's at his computer and he's like, hmm, what kind of movie should I make? Uh, what about that high school band teacher who was mean to me? So he makes Whiplash, and like, literally the moment it releases, he's talking to people in the audience saying, oh, this? Th this is nothing. Wanna see my screenplay for La La Land? But Whiplash is a big hit with the critics, it makes a bunch of money, and most importantly, Weird Al makes jokes about it. So Damien goes back to the studios and he's like, my movie just won an Oscar for the farmer's insurance guy. And big studio guy goes, oh my god, and gives him 30 million dollars. At some point, someone, let's say studio man, says, eh, you gotta whiten up those leads. And Damien's like, oh you want white? I'll show you white and he casts Miles Teller and Emma Watson. Then he's like, no, 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 wait, I'll do you one better, and casts Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. So they make the movie, and Gosling learns to play the piano, and everyone's like, wow, is there anything this man can't do? And then Gosling starts singing, and he's like, and everyone's like, oh, okay. So La La Land premieres as the opening film for the Venice Film Festival, and it's an immediate hit. And it starts hopping from festival to festival, and everyone starts asking, so, like, is it, like, is it gonna win the, the, the Oscars awards? And pretty quickly, all the awards people are like, oh, oh yeah, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna win the, them awards. So La La Land competes in what we call the Precursors, which are all these smaller award shows that happen before the Oscars that give us an idea of who's probably going to do well at the Oscars and who's totally not. It's sort of like the playoffs before the World Series, but if the players were allowed to have fancy parties with the umpires before the games. Anyway, La La Land pretty much sweeps all the major precursors. The Critics' Choice Awards, Here we go. La La Land. the BAFTAs, La 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 La. it breaks the record for the most Golden Globe wins ever, La La Land. and it even nabs Best Comedy at the AARP Movies for Grown Ups Awards. And when Oscar nominations come out, it gets 14. For some context, that is the most for a single film, ever. Only two other movies have gotten 14, All About Eve and Titanic. And what better a metaphor for La La Land than a big, expensive boat that definitely, probably won't sink. So then it's Oscar night, and La La Land has been doing pretty good. There were two technical awards it was expected to win, but apparently everyone had been in a coma since the 80s and was like, let's give some to the Mel Gibson movie. And Mel Gibson was like, I sure hope there aren't any Jews here at this Academy Awards. Ceremony. But then Damien Chazelle wins Best Director, and now it's clear that La La Land has this thing in the bag. But Warren Beatty is presenting Best Picture, and he's just terrified staring at the envelope, like it's got the date and cause of his own death written on it. But everyone in the audience is thinking, oh my god, we know it's La La Land, just get it over with. I want to leave this room full of celebrities and go to the Vanity Fair party so I can hang out in a room full of celebrities. And Faye Dunaway snatches the card away from Warren, and she's like, what do you think it is, pixels? Get the hell up here, La La Land. And now the world knows that objectively, La La Land is the best movie of the year. The end. Except... Flashback to 2003. This is Terrell Alvin McCraney. His mom just died, and believe it or not, he is sad. 
and he's thinking about his life growing up in Liberty City, Miami, the homophobic bullying he endured, the drug dealer slash kind-hearted father figure he knew named Blue, and he writes it all into a play-ish script called In Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue. And then he's like, well, guess I won't be thinking about this for a decade. So roughly one decade later, this is Barry Jenkins, and he is spending his days getting ignored in the writing staff of The Leftovers. He comes home and he stares disappointedly at his dusty 2009 Independent Spirit Award nomination for someone to watch, the way the guy at the start of a Cialis commercial stares at his wife. He got that nomination for a $15,000 indie romance starring Wyatt Cenac from The Daily Show, and it got good reviews, and Brad Pitt was watching in the shadows like, soon. But Barry hasn't made a movie since, and boy oh boy does he know it. He wrote a bunch of scripts and had a bunch of meetings, but nothing panned out. So now Barry's producer friend Adele Romansky calls him up and she's like, Barry, honey, listen to me, I've got the greatest idea. What if, hear me out, what if you made another movie? And Barry's like, wow, what an amazing idea. And Adele says, it'll be super easy. All you gotta do is get a script that's really, really, really good that no one else wants and can be produced with a really small budget. Simple, right? So they go searching for a script and they stumble upon this play called In Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue, remember that? And Barry Jenkins looks at it and he's like, hold up, I also grew up in Liberty City. My mother also struggled with addiction. I was also part of the Borscht Arts Collective, what the hell? So he acquires the rights, adapts it into a screenplay, and blurs the lines between which parts are Terrell Alvin McCraney and which parts are Barry Jenkins. So he has a meeting with this production company called Plan B Entertainment, and a voice says, I've been expecting you, Mr. Jenkins. And a big chair swivels around, and it's Brad Pitt! And Brad Pitt says, I'm going to produce your film. That's good. But I'm not going to finance it. That's bad. But A24 will finance it. That's good. But they'll give you a $1.5 million budget. <laughs> That's good. No, no, that... Damien Chazelle rejected that. That it was insultingly low. That's that's bad. Can I go make Moonlight now? And Barry goes to Florida and shoots this thing in like a month. Naomi Harris was in the middle of a James Bond press tour and had literally three days to shoot all of her scenes and no time for rehearsals. And Mahershala Ali flew in on the weekends like a long distance divorced dad. And when this movie is done, A24 goes up to them and they're like, First off, I just want to say that you all have done some amazing work, and second, here's our marketing budget. At least they could afford to make this poster. It's, it's pretty cool, right? So the film premieres at Telluride, and that's actually pretty meaningful, because Barry Jenkins actually worked for Telluride for is years. Is that La La Land? Hey everyone! La La Land is at Telluride! Let's go watch La La Land again! Yeah, apparently La La Land was doing reruns at Telluride. Ouch. Some people saw it at least, and those who did seem to really love it. Also, Deadline called it Black Brokeback Mountain for some reason. But Moonlight started picking up speed as it screened more and more, and pretty much all the reviews were glowing. They didn't have much money for marketing yet, but clearly the word of mouth was good enough to get its foot in the door with the precursors. The National Board of Review gave it Best Director and Best Supporting Actress, which are pretty big early wins for a movie that the general public hadn't even heard of yet. Then Critics' Choice gave it Best Supporting Actor and Best Acting Ensemble, with nominations in a ton of other categories, including Best Picture, and it gained a little more momentum. It won Best Picture Drama at the Golden Globes, but it wasn't directly competing with La La Land in that category, so that just got ignored. As did its eight Oscar nominations, including heavy hitters like Best Picture, Best Director, Best Supporting Actress, Best Supporting Actor, and Best Adapted Screenplay. That means it should be considered a real Best Picture contender, right? Well, it was nominated for the top prize at the Producers Guild Awards, it was nominated for the top prize at the SAG Awards, and it's nominated for the top prize at the DGA Awards, but it loses all of them. And then there was the BAFTAs. The British Academy of Film Awards doesn't really have the best history when it comes to not snubbing people of color. For example, this is Denzel Washington. He has two Oscars on eight nominations. He has three Golden Globes on nine nominations. He even has a Tony Award. 
And yet he has zero BAFTAs on zero nominations, ever. Including this very year for Fences, where he was once the frontrunner for Best Actor and was playing the same role he won his Tony for. So when it came time to nominate Moonlight, they gave it the absolute minimum. Categories that it had been regularly picking up nominations for, like cinematography, editing, or, you know, like, director, those just weren't good enough for the BAFTAs. The BAFTAs were only going to nominate it in the most visible categories. So they went with Best Picture, Best Supporting Actor, Best Supporting Actress, and Original Screenplay. And it didn't win any of them. So now Moonlight's Best Picture chances have kind of nosedived. And it's a shame that that happened to Moonlight, because that metaphor would have been so much better for Sully. Sully instead hit a bunch of geese and just straight up crashed and everyone died. It was supposed to be a huge Best Picture contender, oh well, anyway. The WGA Awards happen, and it's good news, sort of. Moonlight wins Best Original Screenplay. Now, for some reason, this very same guild decided that Moonlight, even though it's very clearly and openly based on a play, is not an adapted screenplay. Well, the Oscars disagreed, because they had already nominated it for adapted screenplay, so winning the WGA Award for Original Screenplay means it's picking up momentum for a category it's not even eligible for. Don't get me wrong, Adapted is certainly an easier category to win this year, but like, it's a lot harder when they just found out that they're in it. So then the day before the Oscars, it gets to take an easy win at the Independent Spirit Awards. La La Land is not a tiny indie baby, so it's not allowed to hang out with the cool kids. This means Moonlight is free to demolish the competition. Seriously, Moonlight at the Indie Spirits is not even fair. It's like if a boxer kept coming up short against her opponents, so she just goes out and starts beating up strangers to regain her confidence. But a day later, we are back at the Oscars. People in the audience are chuckling to themselves, thinking about how hilarious it was when Steve Harvey named the wrong person at Miss Universe, and how no one is ever going to forget about that. Moonlight wins the two Oscars it was expected to win, Best Supporting Actor for Mahershala Ali, and Best, yes, this is actually adapted, screenplay. But they called La La Land for Best Picture, and it's time to go home. Now, just because La La Land won doesn't mean we can't do a little theorizing. If Moonlight were to win, how would it pull that off? Well, let's look at the math. Bear in mind that this model is based primarily off of precursor stats and history, but Oscar races are often decided from narratives. For La La Land, we can see that it starts off pretty well, it takes a huge jump around the BAFTAs, and then it wins. For Moonlight, you can see that it was actually pretty close to La La Land for most of the time. And then we hit PGAs, and the BAFTAs, and that's just kind of it for Moonlight. But of course, this isn't a hard science. Most Oscar voters don't look at the ballot and just vote for whichever movie has the most Kansas City Film Critics Circle awards. And sometimes narratives are everything at the Oscars. For example, Casey Affleck nearly swept the precursors for Best Actor, so our model would say that he's very likely to win the Oscar. But of course, the model doesn't account for the multiple sexual harassment allegations against him, which surely would have prevented him from- Casey Affleck. Oh. Other factors that contribute to the Oscar success of a film can include box office success, critical acclaim, and very rarely, even the quality of the film. Studios do everything they can to push narratives they like, but they can only play with the hand they're dealt. And once you're making the final push for your films before Oscar winners are announced, the way people talk about your film has long since solidified. I think these billboards really illustrate how the studios wanted people to think about their movies. Look at La La Land. This is the absolute cockiest thing they could have done. For context, most of these billboards look like this. They're just covered in accolades and quotes, and it's LA traffic so they know you've got time to read it all. But La La Land says nothing. You can't even see the movie star's faces. But they know that if you're an awards voter, you've seen this poster a million times, so you'll know exactly what this is. They're not asking you to vote for La La Land, they're telling you, we already know you're voting for La La Land. So how does Moonlight compete? They put their billboard on the same block. And they don't just cover it in precursors and paragraphs from Chris Stuckman. They want it to stand out and send a very clear, singular message. One quote. It changes everything. Moonlight. Because despite La La Land's seemingly unstoppable momentum, not everyone has stuck with it. It was kind of like a song on the radio that might have been pretty catchy at first, but now it's been months and you're just sick of it. And now there's this growing demand for contrarians around the world to shove in the faces of the La La Land plebeians. 
And what's been trailing La La Land the whole time? Moonlight. And it's everything that La La Land isn't. It is a small, intimate drama with a cast of nobodies about concepts rarely explored in Oscar films. It doesn't sweep the Golden Globes, it sweeps the Indie Spirit Awards. It's not a love letter to the way things were, it's a reflection of the way things are. And so are narrative forms. La La Land is the movie that will win, but Moonlight is the movie that should win. People are already preemptively frustrated that the Oscars are going to overlook Moonlight in favor of what they see as an overrated, overmarketed relic of the 50s. Sure, La La Land's good, but does it really deserve to be tied for the most nominations ever? Does Emma Stone really deserve to dominate fan-favorite performances from Isabelle Huppert and Natalie Portman? Does Ryan Gosling's character being switched to a white guy make him into a sort of white savior of a predominantly black genre of music, especially when he's trying to save it from John Legend? I think one of the most telling signs of La La Land's doom was at the Screen Actors Guild Awards. You may have noticed that I didn't say it was nominated for SAG's biggest award, Best Film Ensemble, and that's because it wasn't. And while the winner of this category doesn't always win Best Picture at the Oscars, the Best Picture winner at the Oscars is almost always nominated for Best Ensemble. In fact, at this point in time, Braveheart was the only movie ever to win Best Picture without being nominated for Best Ensemble, and that was at the very first SAG Awards. Now, to be fair, SAG does have a bias towards large casts in this category, and La La Land does not have that. At best, La La Land's cast has three principal actors, but actually, that should be enough. Million Dollar Baby and Beasts of No Nation were nominated with three actors, and they didn't have nearly the hype that La La Land did. This is a huge problem, because the largest branch of the Academy is the acting branch, and almost all of them are SAG members, so if they'd rather give a big nomination to whatever the hell Captain Fantastic is than La La Land, they might be just as stingy with their Oscar votes. But La La Land won and it was kind of like a peek into an alternate timeline. Kind of like how La La Land's epilogue was a look at a different relationship between its leads Mia and Sebastian, or how Moonlight's third act was Terrell Alvin McCraney ruminating on how his life could have turned out. But then the crew starts storming the stage, and they look at the envelope in the La La Land producer's hand, and oh my god, it's got the date and cause of Warren Beatty's death on it. And also it says Moonlight won Best Picture. Everyone loses their minds, except Brad Pitt, who's just in the corner like... Very impressive, Mr. Jenkins. The Moonlight crew got to give some abridged speeches, and then it was just over. The biggest Oscar screw-up ever just happened, and that was the story. No one was talking about the journeys of Barry Jenkins and Terrell Alvin McCraney. Moonlight's victory wasn't a triumphant underdog story, it was a late-night talk show punchline. While Moonlight did experience its peak in the box office the following week, it was only a fraction of what the dying La La Land was pulling in. Moonlight became just the answer to a trivia question because this accountant was snapping pictures of Emma Stone instead of paying attention to the envelope. But maybe that's not Moonlight's legacy. Because this was a turning point in the Academy. After Moonlight came the Me Too movement and a push for greater diversity among the old guard of the Academy. Very recent wins like Jared Leto or Casey Affleck are hard to imagine happening today. Moonlight was the first all-POC cast in a Best Picture winner, the first LGBTQ Best Picture winner, it had the first Muslim acting winner, the first black woman to be nominated for editing, and many of those feats have been repeated since. The next year, unconventional Oscar films like Get Out and Call Me By Your Name succeeded as well. The year after that, Green Book happened. But don't let that diminish the unprecedented success of Roma, which paved the way for Parasite to become the first foreign language Best Picture winner ever. While Moonlight will forever be linked to the far more popular La La Land, its individual impact on the awards industry and film as a whole is already being felt. No single film can turn the tides on its own, but it's important to recognize the ones who make the first waves. <laughs>